You reach out, I think you reached out to me first when we were talking about this. I did. And you said what? I said, wouldn't it be nice to have a panel where we could just talk about our concerns and issues in the field? And I responded with, I'm going to raise you and say, wouldn't it be nice to have a panel where we could talk about our you know, concerns and wishes for the field that also involved alcohol? Um, <laughs> but, but, but here's why. And, and this is why we named this panel Behavior Analysts and Bars. There's something really special that happens in our field at conferences. And I'm not talking about the keynotes and I'm not talking about the panels. I'm talking about the social opportunities that we have with each other um, at the end of conference days when we meet, uh, usually in a bar. And this is when we really get into the juicy stuff. That's where the great conversations happen. Yeah. You learn about cool things you didn't know about, but yes. also that's like where you get, at least from in my perspective, the return on your investment for how much you're spending at those, mm -hmm. because you can network and you can like then find the people, the resources, the things that lead to all of that time, energy, cash being worth it. Right. And so it, it, again, it, it, the alcohol is actually irrelevant, but it's that there is the environment is arranged and is conducive and occasions these honest conversations. And so when Justin and I started talking about that, I was thinking, who are two other people that we could involve in this that also are really uh, dedicated to honest conversations? And it was you two. And I think between the four of us, we bring really unique perspectives um, in terms of what we love about the field of behavior analysis, what we have concerns about in the field of behavior analysis, but also all of us are committed to engaging in meaningful dialogue and even collegial disagreements, but in a respectful way. And we really feel like, and I know Justin and I have had this conversation many times, that is missing that kind of respectful disagreement and discourse is missing in behavior analysis. People are going online. They you are we're blaming and shaming each other. You know, and it, just because we don't always think the same way doesn't mean that we can't be colleagues in the end, and doesn't mean that they're not going to be some points of intersection eventually. And you guys know, I was all uncomfortable when we made the joke about the bar, which isn't a joke because it is a real point we're making that you we have a tendency to have these conversations in those more casual settings. So if you guys remember when Sarah first said, oh my, then we could like make the stage into like a bar and we could do it in the same thing. And I was like, no, 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 no. And when you just commented on social media, my reason for getting concerned was you see people then you know, commenting, oh, why does it have to be about drinking? Why does it have to be about, and actually I ended up loving it because it does bring up the point of what ties us all together. Mm -hmm. And that is behavior analysis because you're talking about stimulus control mm -hmm. and I'm okay with that. When I thought of it that way, I thought, you know what? She's right. That is really an interesting point. We're in a different setting and therefore we speak differently. We interact differently. We might be able to get into an argument and recognize that it's not about the arguing part of it. It's about having differing views and we work through it. And that's not been set in those big rooms and those big panels. It is set in the bar. So that for the record, the only reason why is that we can give a behavior analytic account of the stimulus control that is available in that setting that I'm willing to sit on a stage that looks like a bar. Are we really drinking? <laughs> I mean, I think that's a, a point of discussion that we can, you know, kind of figure out closer to the actual uh, <laughs> date of our presentation, which is going to be on Saturday, March 7th. I think we're at the 4 p.m. slot. Yeah. In the general session room, we yeah. want to bring, have as many people join us as possible. And so let's maybe preview uh, yeah, for everybody. Yeah, what are some of the topics it. that we want to get into? What are we going to be talking about? What pisses you off, Justin? Yeah. Angry <laughs> Justin, go. What doesn't? <laughs> no. Um, let's, let's maybe each list something that we're like frustrated about. Um, yeah. I think, I think one thing that really we need to talk about is about ensuring that quality intervention is occurring. And so often what I see in clinics uh, nationally and internationally is just kind of this rote, static uh, intervention that's happening. People are just going for a protocol and they're just following that protocol and not moving from that protocol. And it's not the way that's the best for children with autism and where they can make the most meaningful differences and gains. And so that's uh, one thing I would like to bring up is going away from following uh, protocols to T and having flexibility and using clinical judgment within teaching. And you know, Justin, can I ask you a question? I, and I don't wanna to go too far off topic, but it helps me kind of build on what I'd like my point to be on that. 
Would you say that, and I don't, you probably know if there's research to back this, would you say that a clinician uh, is going to be more fluent with respect to implementing natural environment training procedures or teaching procedures if they're fluent uh, in discrete trial procedures first? Was that, is that something that you would kind of, even just anecdotally or? Yeah, I, I, th I think, yeah, yeah. I, think, I, think, I think they would be better at natural environment if they were fluent and discrete travel, travel way bigger topic. I know. I, th I think I think they're more fluent if they're fluent in any procedure if they understand principles. And then the and, and if they understand principles, they can implement any procedure. I think the problem is people are getting trained on implementing a certain procedure, like a preference assessment, and so they know how to do uh, a formal preference assessment, mm -hmm. but don't understand the principles behind that. Or yeah. and so I think that's what you have to train on and critical thinking. The reason why I brought it up uh, is exactly what you just said. You know, you and I share a very similar value system and listening to your comments in terms of the value of understanding the concepts and principles to inform better practice and completely agree with everything you said about concerns about what I've also seen in early intervention programs. What's fascinating is for me, Yes, what Justin just said, but when it comes to working with adolescents, young adults, adults, we're actually facing a whole other issue with respect to having to define what quality intervention looks like. Mm -hmm. Because now what we're doing is services that are largely community-based, community living, out there in the world every day, not in a traditional home-like setting that we usually would see, or a school-based setting, or a center for early intervention. Still ABA though, right? But what's happening that I have challenges with is seeing BCBAs then who now need to translate goals to be more meaningful for that population, also to go from a discrete trial format to more naturalistic teaching. So right there we have some issues that build on what you just said, but separately then we actually have a whole population of staff members that are interested in working with this group of individuals that don't have the background in discrete trial training and instruction, and we're expecting them to implement quality services in a community-based setting, which involves way more moment-to-moment -moment changes in the interaction. So I only brought it all up to ask, I was wondering what you thought on that, because I'm struggling. Do I have staff members now learn discrete trials? Why would I do that? Well, is it because it gets them to learn the principles more? The take home point being, I think this is a good opportunity for us to talk about, we really need to take a look at what we really mean when we say quality intervention mm -hmm. and quality outcomes and just quality. That word is multifaceted. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quality and meaningful outcomes. Like yeah. I, I'm sick of seeing people teaching skills like uh, dog breeds or, or types of birds, uh, types of birds, international flags and stuff like that. Well, I mean, what difference is that gonna make for a child? Like, I know I'm not going to teach my child the different like state capitals right now when he's five years old. Why are we f focusing on that with them? It's just not gonna lead to meaningful outcomes later in life, which is a problem. And, and I think part of this is, is, is a broader issue um, and we, identified that we wanted to touch on this in, in this panel, and my point is this, is the idea of that currently right now in our field, we are treating our behavior analyst certification as this, uh, you know, kind of ceiling um, of skill, but it's a, a minimum, it's a minimum credential. Um, and the BACB would, would say that, that this is a, this is a minimum, it's an entry level credential. Uh, and I think we are confusing being a certificate and understanding of what our scope of practice is within uh, certificate holders and what our scope of competency is. And what I hear from, from you guys saying and what I, I'm hearing over and over in our, our field is, is that I think we need to be really clear in our messaging, especially to young behavior analysts, which are becoming rapidly the majority of our field, um, are people that have been certified for less than, than five years. And if you look at the projection data from the behavior analyst certification board, that group of young people will just start to be even a larger portion of our field is to really implore them to understand that this is the beginning, your certification's the beginning. For sure, and I think, and this brings up uh, a few of the points that I think are like pressures of the field right now. So for example, with those sort of things going on and the change in ways in which uh, things influence us now with social media, with podcasts, with those sort of things going on. I almost look to it as our field is struggling with the realization of like where attention is at now and that we need to spend our time on creating things for those mediums, if that makes sense. Um, and in a way, that also 
breeds into another one there, which is I see sometimes people complaining about where that attention is. You should be focusing on the articles. You should be focusing on the data. You should be going to your state associations. But I look at it as a kind of a flip where that needs to come from our leaders and the people that have that knowledge in the field, figuring out how to reach those people. Mm -hmm. And it sometimes feels like this is what should be going on with the younger generation rather than how do we reach that younger generation. Mm -hmm. And it's almost, and it doesn't mean that anyone needs a compromise, it's we need to start working together. And that's kind of like the larger systemic issue I feel like mm -hmm. is if we could get a lot of the leadership and the larger organizations on the same page, we could start moving a lot more efficiently in uh, the direction that we're trying to go. And there's a lot of little little things that people are trying to do all over the place, but it's just in no way efficient. We see that through the most recent BACB changes, the way that the Association of Behavior Analysis International replied to it, saying we didn't know what was going on. Like These things create inefficiencies for our field, and if anything, I think what it does is just create um, not like a disrespect, but for a lack of like, why should I pay attention to those things for the younger generation? Mm -hmm. Because they do not, like if anything, it seems like, oh, there's some folks that disagree. Like, what, what use does that do me? We, you know, for my practitioner needs, for my needs to be able to learn this field right now, like it just it doesn't. When you think about it, like kind of a matching law perspective of like what's valuable, I don't see how that's like the most. It doesn't seem like we're stacking the deck in our favor to pay attention to some of these really important people, really important assets, really important organizations. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Ryan, you just. You said so many, so many sorry. things. No, it was good. <laughs> I was like, oh, wait, yeah, that good. no, don't. You know, I'm the one that says sorry all the time, not you. Come on, we got to work on that together. Uh, all right. So I've actually, when I appreciate what you said with respect to the leaders in that scenario. However, I will totally acknowledge what I've struggled with recently, like as in the last few weeks. After leaving the CAST conference, I am currently the CALABA chair. You know, I'm an invited speaker at the mm -hmm. upcoming APBA. I mean, you want to go name organization yeah. and different things here. Coming into my team and trying to talk about these things, it's so fascinating to hear you say that because I became very, very aware of, wow, they not only might not know what I'm talking about, but do they care and why do I want them to care? And it really kind of made me have to kind of take a many steps back and say, wait, what is the value of this? Because I need to figure out how to make sure that they feel invested in it and it's not in the same things that got me excited and invested 10, 20 years ago when we started. They don't, they don't necessarily care about having a publication. They don't necessarily care about being on a board. And Do I need to make them care about that? And so I've been struggling a bit and I actually just recently uh, thought, you know what will be a good idea is let's just start with like a grid. Let's take a behavior analytic approach to break it down with, okay, let's go through every major organization. Let's talk about what their legal entity is. Are they profit, non-for-profit? Let's talk about what their mission is, mm -hmm. their primary activities, and then the biggest category that I've actually learned a lot from Sarah on this. I don't know why I just sounded surprised that I learned something. <laughs> Uh, membership benefits, right? Like I, I, I never thought, I didn't think those of us that were born in the field the way uh, some of us were, it was like, you yeah. go, you go no matter what. And yeah. if you don't go, someone's going to harm you in your school. Like, I mean, you have to go. These guys, that's not the same case. So that notion of what it truly means to have a membership benefit and then, and what those benefits are to being a part of it. So I'm just thinking of, like, it sounds silly. I don't think this will fix everything, but I'm just starting to realize we do need to start providing more visual breakdowns do an analysis, start with the education that we're to explain, because I can tell they don't know what accreditation is versus credentialing versus just uh, learning yeah. more about the science. Mm -hmm. And then what do you get out of this? And then I think a controversial category should be leaders now, A, training ourselves on how best to get them interested, which involves us having to remember why they need to be interested. And then B, taking a moment and saying, what are the potential limitations and potential contributions of these current organizations right now? And let's get real about this. And yeah. we do the same thing with respect to our research, right? We end mm -hmm. every article saying, here's the potential limitations, here's mm -hmm. the potential contributions. Yeah. We need to openly say this now and not be like, oh, I don't know. Oh, look, that person's at that conference. Oh, look, that person's in that social media post with that person. Does mm -hmm. that mean they like this or that? <laughs> and stop. Let's lay it out and look at what is needed and who seems to be meeting those needs best. Are we and, off track of what we're going for? No, but no. no but yeah, because I, this is what I, I, I want you guys to think about, um, because kind of what's being becoming salient in, in this conversation is, yes, the need for a greater understanding of kind of the broader 
current infrastructure and behavior analysis um, and appealing to young behavior analysts who want to engage with these groups and for them to have a better understanding of, of maybe why they, they should or shouldn't. But I also think kind of what Justin's saying, and this ties into the BACB ethics, we also need to understand as you know certified professionals, and I understand that not everyone's certified, but that's primarily the audience we're speaking to, um, that we actually have an obligation um, as part of our certification to continue to, you know, move forward as a field to, to uphold the values of our field. But to, to Justin's point, you know, I think it's really challenging for younger people in behavior analysis right now to hear like, we need to do things that are quality, but they don't have exemplars of that yeah. and non-exemplars. <laughs> um, and so I think we, you know, need to be much better, do a much better job of, you know, operationally defining what, what does that mean? Yeah. And, and obviously there's multiple entities right now in behavior analysis that understand the need for this. And this isn't on, you know, it started and this is going to be an ongoing um, conversation, it, but I think to really appeal to to young behavior analysts who may or may not be part of their state association, who may or may not be part of larger national organizations, minimally, if you are a person that is working in a, a human service field, of which we are, and our primary goal, primary goal in the work that we do, and you know, I love Pat Fryman, we talk about this a lot, is alleviating human suffering that you should give a shit um, about doing better for that kid that's in front of you right there. And I think that that's where we need, I think that that's where some of our messaging needs to go as a field. How do we break this down to like the individual practitioner that if nothing else, you owe it to that child or that teenager or that adult that is sitting across from you or sitting next to you or whose classroom that you're walking into or whose home that you're entering, that it's your job you are this, uh, have this amazing science and technology to help them do better. And so it's up to you to continue to understand that your credential is that entry point, but that there are all of these types of other tools and trainings available for you. So that impact that you're putting, that you're making with that person that's right in front of you right now is the most powerful. And I, and I think that that's the message that we need to do a better job of in behavior analysis is sometimes I think when we do these like kind of broad, we need to do quality, whatever, but we need to make it really salient. like. How are you doing right by the person that's in front of you right now who and you're getting paid to work with them you have financial benefit from this so you have an obligation as responsibility yeah you know where i'm gonna go with that uh two things uh one i think it is unfortunately the concerns around this come back to the extent to which people genuinely understand what aba is and i will even say bcbas that might not understand what ABA is. And I, 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 I might have contributed to this. I was a professor, I worked in grad programs. You know, I think there's a lot of push to train people because of a need. Uh, I can tell you right now, we started hiring people in my organization for the first time that already had their credential as an RBT. And on the first day of training, I start usually by saying, hey guys, I just wanna, let's take this away from autism right now and from the services and let's just have a moment on what ABA is. And I usually have this whole thing where I'm like, look, we're talking, you're making eye contact. I'm, I'm reacting to you, you're my environment. That's influencing my behavior right now, vice versa. Like I just try and do this like moment. If you guys suddenly started looking bored, that would make me stop, right? I'm not kidding you. It was about six, seven months ago, we started getting more and more employees again that already came in with an RBT, which was new for us, right? Because they hadn't had that. And more often than not, they had this look on their face and I'd stop and be like, what, what, is everything okay? And the person would say, I'm so sorry. I had no idea that this had anything to do with anything about our behavior. I thought it was just for working with kids with autism. Mm -hmm. So there's clearly a fundamental issue here around yeah. that. And the only reason why I'm saying it, guys, is I believe if you genuinely, genuinely understand what we mean when we say behavior is a function of its environment on all levels, not only do you do better work with the individual, meet those needs that you just mm -hmm. said, but you also then actually have a more vested interest in it likely because you recognize how amazing it is for your own life too, just the whole thing. I don't want to sound cultish, like that's right. the reality. And then my second part to what you know you just said is uh, that which defines social significance. I think we've got a minimum level of training coming in, which is fine. The BACB even says that, entry level right. credential. That's why we have continuing ed units. Right. Like, so it, well, I'm not gonna say if it's fine or not, but I'm gonna say that it is the way it is right now. Uh, and what happens then though is that their understanding of social significance is 
definitely at the level of is the client progressing? Perhaps they understand enough to say, wait, what social validity are the caregivers satisfied? What I think a lot of people don't know is that social significance is defined also at the level of the impact on society. Mm -hmm. So finances and money have to come into this conversation mm -hmm. from a clinical perspective though, mm -hmm. not from like some private equity, blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. Like, this is actually part of our definition of social significance. We need to make sure that we're offering services that produce the highest quality outcomes, got to define that term, in with the least amount of resources. Because yes. I explain to my team a lot that, guys, we're paying for the services we're offering, whether it's insurance or regional yeah, center in all California, of us it's it. either my tax dollars or the insurance. That is an odd thing when you think of that, right? So we have got to figure out how to get all practitioners to understand that those different levels of social significance, the individual, their family, school, but society mm -hmm. on a whole, and that brings up money. Yeah. Sorry, kids. We're funded roughly at the same amount as the entire substance use disorder category, which is a four to one prevalence rate in the states, as opposed to one autism, to 59 yeah, yeah one to 59 or one mm -hmm. to 38 yeah yeah there's some big discrepancy there well sure and you think that health plans aren't paying attention to this mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. when the commercial health care spend on ABA services in California is more than two or two and a half billion dollars annually and that's not medical that's just commercial mm -hmm. um, yes and Go, sorry. No, you go. But that, I mean, that your point is is one of my concerns. We have a history in our field where we see what happens if we're not making social significant gains for the clients and quality outcomes, which we can't have a whole discussion of how at least I define it. I'm sure we all have differing opinions of that. But we saw that in the United Kingdom. The United mm -hmm. Kingdom, it, it's, it's what happened. They didn't have behavioral services, a behavior intervention for kids with autism. Uh, they started to sue, parents started to sue. They provided behavioral intervention because they said, let's do it. Uh, there's enough court cases in the United Kingdom. What then happened was they were smart. They started to fund it. They took data. They showed that it was not effective. And then they stopped funding it. And to think we are not, that's not going to happen to us. Well, we have that crazy. TRICARE report. Yeah, yeah I don't the think that's yeah. not going to happen yeah. to us. Yeah. I think it's, yeah. And the sad thing is when, uh, when my colleagues and I wrote an RBT paper, which are concerns, that was one of our concerns. We, we talked about that experience and we have to watch out for it. It's happening. And my concern is if we don't quickly all get on the same page, don't quickly start improving the interventions out there and improving the outcomes, uh, we're going to be out of a field. Like our field's going to be gone because other fields are coming in and they can, if they can do it better, more costly, have the same kind of outcomes, why would they pay mm -hmm. us? Yeah. Why, why would they need us? And especially when I don't think we have the best PR and I don't think we put the best face forward where we're cold and unempathetic, according to a lot of parents out there, we're in trouble. And I mean, I think for me, what, what is so important is just always taking it from the parents of the par uh, the perspective of the parents mm -hmm. and that the parent like the parents are trusting their kids lives in our hands mm -hmm. every single day and so we just always have to see what is in the best need for that kid it's a it's an amazing power that they're that they're really giving to us well I also think that there's some pretty core training deficits um, that aren't being addressed in graduate programs in behavior analysis and in addition to those those core deficits, which, from my perspective, generally uh, re revolve around leadership, uh, effective staff management, conflict management, operational uh, understanding, compassionate care, um, establishing positive therapeutic relationships. What we're also doing as a field right now is our graduate programs are churning out graduates that can pass an exam. And that speaks to the point that you made earlier, Rachel, that you're even at the RBT level, you know, you're providing some more context of like what is behavior analysis in a, a larger perspective not related to autism, but the fact that those people that are credentialed could not put that together because they have been provided training that will allow them to pass an exam. And, and there's nothing wrong with having the, uh, this minimum standard and, and having our certification. I've been board certified for almost 16 years and it's something I value tremendously. And I, this is fantastic, but we have to do better than that. And we that also means as a field that we have to place value on these skills. And that's where I think we, we're falling short. Um, we're falling short in you know the dissemination, which we all have an ethical obligation to do, is to further disseminate uh, behavior analysis outside of our own behavior analytic echo chambers. Um, we have an obligation 
to you know be running businesses and, and working in businesses that are, are doing not only quality work for their their clients but also operating in an ethical way but that requires skill sets um, that no one has and then you have like in a state like California we have no licensure laws and so the the minimum standard for someone to be able to access uh, health insurance um, reimbursable rates or reimbursement rates is your minimum uh, certificate and so we have all of these new businesses cropping up um, and we see, I mean, we see this all the time on all the different Facebook groups and I will see questions like, how should I, you know, file for an LLC? Does anyone know about insurance? Hey, do you have a sample treatment plan? Cause I don't really know where to start. Um, and I think it's so great for people to want to be entrepreneurial cause I, I certainly was, but to do so by thinking that your minimum, you know, credential is somehow like, you know, unlocks <laughs> and gives you the right to, to start a business working with some of the most vulnerable people in, in our state is crazy to me. That's uh, it, like, but that's also like the American dream, right? Is like come out, be able to create something and chase your dreams in that sort of sense. And this is where I'm saying. But where does the responsibility come in? Well, and where, it. you know, it's not there, and it's a lack of us working together to be able. Right, to it's an out infrastructure issue. How to best move forward? Sure, and that's it's also it. it's a lack these of are, infrastructure. These are not and, problems right. per se. They're symptoms of a larger systematic issue. Yeah. Of just lack of coordination, and that's not to blame or point anybody out. It's we need to get back together and focus on the systems level of what the professional behavior analysis is. Right where it's at, like you were saying, and where it's going. Right, and, and again, this also, just because we've grown, I mean, I remember I've seen Jim Carr present this data before, and he shows, you know, the growth rate of behavior analysis, and if you look at our growth rate relative to other allied professions, you know, speech pathology, psychology, um, you know, it's a little more of an even trend, and we're just like, woof, and there's no, the end isn't in sight, meaning when are we going to level up? of the current certificates have been cert certified in the last three years. Yes, right? yes, yeah. yes. I think it's 110,000 right now and 55,000 applications were coming to the BACB per year. There's we need to take a closer look at a potential divide between the academics and the practitioners. Okay. And I think right now, appropriately, there's a lot of attention being paid to membership organizations that have some Bad, but ah, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> that, uh, you know, membership organizations that drive the practice or drive the protection of the practice, and that's unbelievably important. I'm in that. Mm -hmm. I believe that in the next few years, we're all going to also realize we have to take one more step back and take a look at the alignment of the graduate training programs, go back to practicum. I feel like we're going to be mm -hmm. revisiting this conversation from like a decade ago. Now, more than ever, I am seeing that divide get bigger. And for me personally, it's hard to see because I've always taken a great deal of pride that I'm, I'm somebody who's kind of been able to be on both sides of that world. And I never thought I'd find myself leaning more towards one than the other. And I'm, I'm doing that lately and I won't admit which side because I, I can't <laughs> I can't handle it actually. Uh, but I think we really need to look at what's happening in the graduate training programs. Uh, and there's some brilliant people doing that. I'm not saying people aren't looking at it, but these are dynamic shifts that are happening. And even listening to you guys right now, I was like, that is a class that needs to happen in a BCBA like required sequence right now, a class on the absurdity of some of the social media posts and we need a smart person sitting in the room and like going through let me tell you how concerning it is that this person is asking for a sample treatment plan like day one of grad school why not right like maybe we just start yeah. calling more of this out but we have to do it across both settings because if yeah. i say something to my employees right now they're in a grad program and i know that their professor's not echoing the time? same thing i lose so if you want to be part of this conversation, if you want to give feedback on this conversation, or if you just want to see if we actually get into an argument with each other, which may or may not happen. <laughs> oh, it's it's going to happen here. Like, then is... you need to catch our talk on Saturday, March 7th at the California Association for Behavior Analysis Annual Conference, 4 p.m. Yeah. General Session Room. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs>